Have you ever been to a family reunion where there's special t-shirts for the event? You know, sometimes the shirts, they'll, they'll all be the same. And sometimes they'll have the same logo on the shirt, but each immediate family will have a different color of the same shirt. Yeah, reunions, they always culminate in a final family photo where everyone's smiling, well, almost everyone, everyone's proudly displaying their shirt. You know, there are some good family reunion shirts out there. I've seen some of them. You know, the best family reunion t-shirts are the ones that are funny. They have a joke on it, or there's a play on words that, that makes you think. Maybe it kind of pokes fun at the family name. You'll see some that say things like, we put the fun in dysfunctional, or watch out, the Bolin family's coming. Hey, here's a few that I've seen recently. These are pretty fun. Check this one out. <laughs> I hate to say, my family hasn't done me very many favors when it comes to good looks. Or there's this one. Yeah, good job. You survived another family reunion. Great job. And you definitely won't be out of a job if you have this shirt. <laughs> hey, does anybody feel like you've needed that t-shirt recently? Maybe you've needed that referee shirt just around your house. Hey, this week we're taking a look at a part of the story of Joseph where there's a family reunion. And if they made a shirt for this family reunion, it might look something like this. <laughs> Israel family reunion. <laughs> Let's look back at what happened so far in the story. A long time ago, there was a guy named Jacob and God gave him the name Israel. And then Jacob had 12 sons. The youngest son was Joseph and Jacob liked him the best. He was the favorite. He got preferential treatment all the time and his brothers didn't like it. Joseph started having these dreams and he told his brothers about these dreams and how these dreams meant that one day all the brothers would bow down to Joseph. And that went over about how you would expect it to. The brothers conspire together and they throw Joseph into a pit and then they sell him to a slave trader that was passing by. They tell their father that Joseph was killed by a wild animal and as far as they were concerned, that was the end of the Joseph story. Well, Joseph is taken to Egypt as a slave. And while he's in Egypt as a slave, his master's wife tries to seduce him, but he runs. He runs from temptation. She ends up accusing him of inappropriate behavior, and it lands him in jail. While he's in jail, he earns a reputation for being able to interpret dreams. Eventually, he's brought out of jail and before Pharaoh to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams. Because of his wisdom that came from his close walk with the Lord, he's able to determine that there's going to be a famine across all the known world for seven years and that Egypt should begin to prepare. So Joseph is given the task and the authority to prepare for this famine. He becomes the second most powerful person in Egypt overnight. Well, the famine does indeed happen, and it affects the known world. Rain became a rare event. The land quit producing the way that it should. Livestock became sick and wasn't the asset that it once was. And people were scared. Many people's livelihood dried up with the rain. Lots of folks were concerned about how they would make ends meet, how they would feed their families kind of sounds like the world we live in today, doesn't it? Where fear and panic are pervasive. And many today wonder how we will make it through. The pandemic has interrupted our sense of stability and it's left us looking for answers. Where do we turn? Jacob, Israel, he heard about the provisions that were available in Egypt. so. He sends his boys, who are grown men really at this point, with families of their own, to go down and buy food for the family. The situation must have been desperate. I mean, Jacob had been a wealthy man. There were pe they were people who knew how to tend the land, how to care for their animals, but things had gotten so bad and it was just out of their control. 
Let's take a look at what Scripture says about how this goes down. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? Hey, isn't that the most dad line you've ever heard? Like, why do you guys just keep looking at each other? Get up and do something, okay? He continued, I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that, so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob didn't send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger, and he spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. I wonder if Joseph had rehearsed this moment over and over in his mind for the last many years. What would he do or say if he ever saw his brothers again? I mean, what would you do if you were treated so badly by someone and then you were presented with an opportunity again? What would you do? Hey, you know who this guy is? <laughs> yeah, I, I bet you do. If you were a kid in the 80s like me, then you know. You know who this guy is. It's Inigo Montoya, the character in the movie, The Princess Bride. And his whole purpose in life is focused on one thing. What is it? It's revenge. Yeah, revenge. If you know his line, come on, say it with me. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Hey. <laughs> Hey, Joseph could have been filled with a desire for revenge. He could have been filled with anger. But because he walked closely with the Lord, his instinct wasn't revenge. He didn't feel like he needed to or he wanted to get even. He questions his brothers about their family, about their younger brother, about their father who was still at home. Joseph wanted to see his youngest brother, Benjamin, who was still at home because they shared a mother. So he does hold the brothers captive for three days, telling them that he would send them home if they would return with little Ben. So Joseph sends the brothers home without revealing his identity. But he does keep one brother in captivity just to make sure, to ensure that they will indeed return one day. Well, as the brothers return home, they discover the silver that each of them used to pay for their grain. It was in the top of their sacks of grain. They didn't know. They didn't know that the man in Egypt was their brother Joseph. All they knew was that he was powerful and that he had resources that they needed to survive. They were afraid. And if the Egyptian thought that they stole the grain, that they didn't pay for it, that somehow they snuck off with the money, oh, that, that caused fear. They wondered several times if God was punishing them for the evil thing they did to their brother Joseph all those years ago. You know, I bet they had told the story of Joseph, Joseph's death so many times and for so long that they had begun to believe it themselves. Have you ever told a lie for so long that, that you start to believe it? You can't distinguish fact from fiction in your own life and in your own stories. Well, they run out of grain again. The famine continues. And they're faced with the need to return to Egypt to purchase more so they can so they convinced their father to let them take Benjamin. I mean, that was the stipulation. If they were going to return, they had to bring Ben. So they make that journey a second time, but this time they're not only worried about how they'll provide for their families, but 
that they might be arrested as thieves when they arrive. Because remember that silver that was in their bags when they left the last time. The story continues like this. So the men took the gifts and, and doubled the amount of silver, and they took Benjamin also. They hurried down to Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to his, the steward of his house, Take these men to my house. Slaughter an animal. Prepare a meal. They are to eat with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and, and took the men to Joseph's house. Now, now the men were frightened when they were taken to his house. They thought, we're brought here because, because of the silver that was put in our sacks that first time. He wants to attack us and overpower us and seize us as slaves and take our donkeys. But when Joseph came home, they presented him gifts they had brought into the house and they, they bowed down before him on the ground and he asked them how they were. And then he said, how is your aged father you told me about? Is he still living? They replied, your servant, our father, is still alive and well. And they bowed down, prostrating themselves before him. As he looked about and saw his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son, he asked, is this, is this your youngest brother, the one you told me about? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and he looked for a place to weep. And he went into his private room and he wept there. After he had washed his face, he came out and controlling himself, he said, serve the food. And they served him by himself and the, the brothers by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews for, for that was detestable to Egyptians. The men had been seated before him in the order of their ages from the firstborn to the youngest, and they looked at each other in astonishment. And when the portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else's. So they feasted and drank freely with him. Can you imagine what it must have felt like in that room? I mean, the brothers were walking into the situation expecting the worst fearing punishment, knowing that they were totally at the mercy of the Egyptian governor. I mean, I heard a, de a definition of mercy as this, not getting what you deserve. You know, those brothers deserve punishment. They sold Joseph and they lied to their father and I'm sure they did all sorts of things that are worthy of punishment. And you know how I know that? Because they were human. And we all do things that deserve punishment. You do, and I do. Each and every one of us is guilty. I tell you what, I'm so glad that with God, we don't always get what we deserve. In the New Living Translation of the Bible, Psalm 145, 8 says, The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. You know, there's times when what we deserve is God's anger, when I deserve God's anger. But praise God, he's slow to get angry. And if anybody ever felt like they had a right to be angry with someone, it was Joseph. I mean, what his own family did to him was unspeakable. But Joseph doesn't hold it against his brothers. He doesn't hold on to an old grudge. He's not keeping score. Joseph was filled with compassion and mercy. Is there a grudge that, that you're holding on to? Something you feel like you just can't let go of? Did somebody hurt you? Are there words that were said to you that you just, you just can't seem to turn off in your head? Holding on to a grudge will keep you from having a great life. Getting even, oh, it, it may feel good in the moment, but it will eat you alive. The desire for revenge, it will rob you of joy and it will leave you full of regret. Over in the New Testament, Paul writes in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, As for you, 
you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Like the rest. Hey, we all share that together. We were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. It's by grace you've been saved. We love to talk about grace. We love to sing songs about grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's, it's one of the most popular songs of all time. And if someone only knows one church song, that's the one they're gonna know, right? Now, mercy, mercy and grace, they're similar things. But I've heard this, that mercy is not getting what you deserve and grace is getting what you don't deserve. Now, that's a pretty simple explanation, but sometimes we don't have to make things that complicated. When that verse says, it's by grace you've been saved, that means this, that Jesus saved you, even though you don't deserve it. And Jesus saved me, even though I don't deserve it. One of the songs we sing here at Mountain says this about God's love. It says, I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. That's grace. That's grace. Sometimes you'll hear the phrase unmerited favor that describes grace. Unmerited favor. That's exactly what Joseph shows his brothers. It's a powerful moment. Joseph is so overcome with emotion at seeing his youngest brother Benjamin that he's moved to tears, so much so that he has to leave the room to weep. And I'm sure, I'm sure it wasn't easy to look in the faces of those brothers who are terrified. But he did the hard thing and he extended grace. He shares his abundance and he prepares a table and they feast together. At Psalm 23, that line says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Well, Joseph, he prepares a table and he gives the best to his enemies. He invites them to his table for the people who had done him wrong. There is healing. There is healing when you can extend that kind of grace. I love the Broadway musical Les Mis. It's this beautiful story about redemption. And there's this amazing picture of grace that happens in that work. Jean Valjean is a convicted criminal and most of his life, he's been on the wrong side of the law. After he's freed from prison, he's taken in out of a storm by a bishop at a local church. He's shown kindness. Then in the middle of the night, he repays that kindness by stealing two silver candlesticks from the bishop. Valjean's quickly arrested with the candlesticks. And when he's taken to the bishop, the bishop tells the authorities, oh no, those candlesticks, they were indeed a gift. And not only that, he forgot the other two candlesticks. He extended grace to Valjean. Those silver candlesticks, they were a gift that wasn't expected, and it certainly wasn't deserved. The, bi the bishop tells Valjean, you must use those precious silver candlesticks to become an honest man. Grace makes a difference. I've seen it make, di make a difference in lives. And there's forgiveness. Forgiveness always costs something. In that story, in Les Mis, it cost the bishop some silver candlesticks. There's a great line from Oswald Chambers that says, forgiveness is the divine miracle of grace. It costs God the cross of Jesus Christ. If you've been wronged, I hope you can, you can find a way to forgive through the divine miracle of grace. Through forgiveness, you can begin to see the hand of God in all that is happening in your life. When Jesus taught us to pray, he said, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It's not forgive us our sins and, and maybe we'll forgive others. I mean, if the thing they did wasn't that bad, it's, Forgive us as we forgive others. 
But, but what if it was really bad? Do we still have to forgive? Like, what if we have to live with the effects of what was done to me? What about, like, being left for dead, sold into slavery like Joseph? Jesus was preaching one time in the book of Matthew. He said this, for, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's a hard word to preach, let me tell you. And it's a hard word to hear. Kind of like when Jesus said, love your enemies. What's that about? Hey, God is the God of love. And he's the God of forgiveness. So if you say you love God, then, then you've got to love people. And you've got to forgive other people. And when you've been extended grace, you can't help but do the same thing. And when you've been forgiven, you just can't help but forgiving other people. St. Francis said it this way in his prayer. It is in forgiving that we are forgiven. So Joseph once again sends his brothers on their way home with the grain. And again, he has their money put back in their sacks. But Benjamin's bag has even more money. And it has Joseph's own silver cup put into the mouth of the bag. And not long after the departure, Joseph sends his guards to retrieve his brothers. Most likely, this was a test. A test to see if they had changed. If their hearts had softened if they were humble, if they had really received the mercy and grace that had been extended and were not just looking to take advantage of the situation. When they're confronted, they, they kneel before Joseph and they beg for mercy. Now this is exactly the dream that Joseph had as a teenager. It's the dream that upset his brothers so much that one day they would kneel before him and here they are and they show that they're not really concerned about their individual freedom. Nobody tries to throw anybody else under the bus and they were worried about what would happen to their father if they didn't, if they didn't return home. They were worried about what their father would say if Benjamin didn't come home. They, they were worried about each other. They stood up for Benjamin. They said, hey, if one of us is arrested, then arrest us all. This doesn't seem like the family Joseph remembered, where they, they all quarreled for position, where they just looked out for themselves, where they were filled with ambition and jealousy. Could this really be the same guys that threw him in a pit and sold him as a slave? Joseph recognized that, that they had changed. But they still didn't recognize him. And after all, it had been a long time. They didn't have pictures of Joseph. There weren't cameras at the time. And they had probably done their best to forget their brother. It's understandable. I mean, people change a lot over the years. Joseph was probably around 17 years old when his brother sold him into slavery. Hey, check this out. Here's a picture of me when I was 17. Pretty different, huh? <laughs> yeah. Hey, and here, here's a young, optimistic, dapper-looking Jared Fox. You recognize that guy? Hey, what about this one? Let's see if you can guess who this one is. That's right, that's Liz Acosta. Well, this picture doesn't really prove the point very well because I don't think Luke Erickson has changed at all since he was 17. That guy looks exactly the same. And here's a good one. I bet you know who this is. Yeah, that's a teenage Ben Kacharis. <laughs> yeah, people change over time, right? Joseph probably looked a whole lot different. He was speaking a different language, communicating through an interpreter. And who would have ever thought that the kids sold to slave traders would become the second in command of all of Egypt? So Joseph... Re reveals his identity to his brothers. This is what scripture says. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence! So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph! Is my father still living? But his brothers weren't able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Every 
jaw dropped to the floor. And I would bet that Joseph wasn't the only one with tears in his eyes. The brothers were terrified. I bet they were. I mean, they were either thinking that their past had finally caught up to them, or that they were seeing a ghost, or both. But they were scared. And I would be too. But then, in a tender, heartfelt moment, the family reunion begins. And Joseph draws them near. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now don't be distressed and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was, it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land and for the next five years, There'll be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler to all of Egypt. But God. But God, Joseph figured out how to have a good life because he was able to see the hand of the Lord in everything, the way God is working all the time. Yeah, that lower story that was going on in Joseph's life, I'm sure it was crazy. I'm sure it felt like a roller coaster with really high highs and really low lows and unexpected turns. Joseph was in tune with that upper story, with the big picture that God was working through all of it. God, but God, God did this. God has been faithful. God keeps his promises. He has and he always will keep his promises. Because Joseph was filled with grace and forgiveness, he could say to his brothers, it's not your fault. Don't blame yourselves because God is working in and through my life, even in difficult circumstances. But God. A little later, Joseph says to his brothers in Genesis 50, verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. But God, you intended evil, but God meant it for good. Joseph is telling his brothers, God worked outside of your intentions to preserve my life so that I could be a part of solving this famine problem in the future. God knew the needs of the world and he worked this out even in the midst of what seemed to be bad. Romans 8, 28, it's another but God verse. It says this, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purposes. Now that verse isn't saying that if you love God, that, that nothing's going to go wrong in your life, or that, that God's going to give you everything you want. But what it is saying is this, that in your life, God is going to work to accomplish good in you and through you that goodness is there in those dark places, in the dark night, that God is there, those tough times, that God is with you. Hey, we've all been treated badly, and we remember it. The lies, the manipulation, the unfair treatment, trauma. Joseph shows us what the first move is for us, to have a good life. We gotta call it out. You gotta call it out when it's evil. It was evil. What you did or said to me or took from me or how you made me feel, it's not okay. It's wrong. It's, this isn't a time to deny it. You can't move anywhere until you call it out. You name it clearly. You put it on the table and you say, this is what hurt. Joseph said that. You meant it for evil. But the next part is the exciting part. It's the but God part, and it makes all the difference. Joseph allowed his trust in God to be bigger than the hurt from others. Joseph could see the hand of God at work in his life. What about you? What about you? 
Can you see what God's doing in your life? Can you see the upper story? Can you rise above the circumstances that, that sometimes make it so difficult to see what God is up to? You know, there's an upper story going on right now for all of us in 2020. It's hard to see. You know, when it seems like so many things aren't right, like everywhere we turn, there's struggle and difficulty. But what if we all had a but God spirit and we looked for what God is up to in 2020? Just like God used Joseph to bring healing and blessing to the world, God wants to use you right now, even in a year like this one, to bring blessing, to bring hope and healing. A great life learns to say, but God. It looks for those but God moments. A great life learns to see God at work in all things. A great life can look back and say, yes, God, you've kept your promises. A great life remembers God's faithfulness. A great life says, God, you were there. You were there when I went through those hard things. Remember that verse from Ephesians we heard a little while ago? It's a but God verse. You were dead in your sins, but God made us alive through Christ. But God, Romans 5, 8, another but God verse. It says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hey, the story of Joseph, it's a wonderful and beautiful picture of our own encounter with God in Christ. Just like Joseph did for his brothers, Jesus came for us to rescue and to save. Christ on the cross bears our sins, forgiving us in the process. Joseph was rejected and ends up saving his brothers. And Christ was rejected and becomes the one, the one that saves us all through that divine miracle of grace. Joseph had some really bad things that happened in his life. And you know what? The cross, the cross that Christ hung on, it was a bad thing. It was a horrible way to die, a tool of intimidation. And I've heard it said this, that the cross was the good, bad thing. Christ dies for us, taking our sins with him to the grave, and then he walks out of the tomb, offering us eternal life. Maybe you're like me. Sometimes I feel like I need to bargain with God, kind of like Joseph's brothers did with him. You know, like I'm fearing punishment, expecting the worst. But you know what? <laughs> when we come to God, we experience his generosity through forgiveness and mercy and grace. Now I know those words, forgiveness, mercy, and grace. Those are words that we use all the time at church, but I hope we never lose the power of those words. Listen to this. God doesn't hold the things that you've done wrong against you. God doesn't hold the things you've done wrong against you. You are forgiven. And instead of getting what you deserve, instead of punishment, it's a party. You're invited to a table where God has prepared a feast for you. It's a miracle of grace, a divine miracle of grace. Isaiah 30, 18 says it this way, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice, and blessed are all who wait for him. He longs to be gracious to you. He's abounding with love for you. He's offering you all the things you long for, the things you hunger for. The table is set and ready, and he's not angry. He's not angry. He's not vengeful. He's smiling and waiting for you to sit down and enjoy the feast that he's prepared with you in mind. So what does a great life look like? A great life, it's one that, that gives and receives forgiveness. A life that gives and receives mercy, and it's a life that gives and receives grace. It's a life that can say, but God, I was dead in my sins, but God saved me through that divine miracle of grace. Mm -hmm.